How many of you have ever been watching a baseball game on television? Let's say you're watching the Rangers play, and the umpire makes a terrible call. He calls Elvis Andrews out at first base when clearly he was safe. And so you're ranting and raving at the television. Everyone in the stadium that is watching it live is ranting and raving, booing the umpire and his decision. But the announcers on the television show a replay. In fact, they show the replay several times. And lo and behold, he was out. This umpire that you accused of dropping more calls than AT&T actually had it right. In fact, they show the replay from several different angles, and of course, every time, he was out. Turns out that this umpire's glass eye wasn't fogged up. He was actually very good at doing his job. You shouldn't feel bad, though, because somewhere high up in the bleachers, in the corner with his nose bleeding, is some guy still ranting and raving because obviously he had a much better view of it than an umpire that was only a few feet away. Sometimes we need to see things from a different angle before we make a judgment. Sometimes we need a little perspective, right? It's kind of like the little boy that was stung by a bee and he comes into the house and he is crying, but he's also angry and he says, I hate bees. I don't know why God made bees. And his mother tries to console him by making him his favorite snack, which is toast and honey. And he starts eating that and he talks about how delicious it is. And his mother tells him, you know, that same bee that you hate, that you despise, is also your friend because it made this delicious honey. And the little boy starts to see things from a different perspective. Because sometimes we need a different perspective. It's kind of like when I was teaching and coaching, one of my responsibilities was the summer baseball and softball program. I got an extra stipend if I organized it from t-ball all the way to high school. We had this little league that we played in with other schools in the area that were too small to form their own. And so instead of playing each other, we'd play these small towns and we would travel a little bit. And it was my job to organize the schedule, the coaches, everything from T-ball all the way up. And there was this one lady that always seemed to have something critical to say about my coaching. No matter what I did, I couldn't please her. And so I went to her and I asked her to coach the Little League team. Little did she know I had an ulterior motive. I wanted her to see things from my perspective. She was honored that I asked her. But if you know anything about Little League Baseball, that's one of the hardest levels to coach. You're going to hear it from parents. And about midway through the season, she came to me and she said, I don't know how you do it. She said, these people won't leave me alone. I can't do anything right. I don't know how you deal with the parents. And I thought, you mean parents like you? <laughs> but she got a whole different perspective when she realized that, that the coaching seat is a lot harder seat than maybe she had first thought. Perspective is everything. It's the armchair quarterback who sits in his recliner and says, if I had that line, I could do so much better than the current quarterback that we have. And when the truth is, he'd be out of breath running onto the field. It's the, it's the politician who's running against the incumbent who thinks he can do so much better. And if he were the president or if he were this or that, he would do it so much differently. And then he gets in office and realizes you really can't move the needle that much. It's a whole different deal when all these problems are in your lap now and you have to deal with them. Or it's the young adolescent that has all these theories on parenting when they don't have kids and they see parents at the mall or at the grocery store dealing with their kids and they say, my kid will never do that. And then they have kids and they realize that all their theories or all of their, their ideas about parenting weren't that good. Perspective is everything. It's a difference maker. And we need to be able to see things from more than one vantage point. Which brings me to the lesson this morning. As the preacher, I need to be able to see things from your vantage point or through your eyes. And rarely do I get to do that anymore. Yes, I am a member at this congregation. But it's also an undeniable fact that I'm the preacher. And sometimes, most of the time, that takes precedence. I can't avoid that. No matter how much I might try, no matter how much I try to just fit in and be a worshiper or a member of this church, 
The undeniable fact is I am the preacher as well. So I have to remember that even though I'm the preacher here, I am also one of you. I have to remind myself of that constantly. And so that, that started me thinking, what is it like to be in the pew, sitting with you, listening to myself week in and week out? Would I want to be a member of this congregation if I weren't the preacher? What would it be like to just sit in the pew with you week in and week out and listen to myself just as a worshiper? What would you expect of me? What would I expect of myself? That kind of forms the thought of the lesson this morning and the lesson next week because next week we're going to look at things from my vantage point. But this morning we're going to look at things from your vantage point. And I'm going to do something pretty dangerous this morning. I'm going to claim to speak for you. Here's what I think you want from a preacher. And I think this is important so that we can better understand one another, so that we can have the best connection with each other as possible. Not that I think there's anything wrong with our, our relationship, not at all. Uh, if you're visiting with us, this is not a red flag. There's no problems here that I can see. But I want to enhance our relationship. And so I got to thinking about what is it like from your vantage point? What would you want from a preacher? And so I'm going to attempt to speak for you. Before I go any further, though, the president and CEO of Lifeway Christian Resources, Tom Rayner, recently asked a few hundred people what they wanted in a preacher. Here are the top responses along with a comment. Number one, a love of the congregation. If we know that our preacher loves us, somebody said, everything else falls in place. If he doesn't, nothing else matters. Secondly, effective preaching. I don't have any expectation that my preacher be one of the best in the world. I just want to know that he has spent time in the Word each week to teach us effectively and consistently. That's what somebody responded with. Third, they want a strong character in their preacher. No preacher is perfect, but I do want a preacher whose character is above reproach on moral, family, and financial issues. Also, a good work ethic. I don't want either a workaholic preacher or a lazy preacher. Unfortunately, this person says, our last two preachers have been obviously lazy. They want a preacher that casts a vision. One person said, our church has so much possibility, I want to hear what we will do to make a difference in our community and the world. Demonstrates healthy leadership. Most of the preachers in my church, this person said, have demonstrated a good balance. They have been strong leaders, but not dictators. They also want a preacher who is joyous. One person said, our current preacher is a man of joy. His joy and enthusiasm are contagious, and I love him for that. Somebody said that they want a preacher that does not yield to critics. I know that every preacher serving today has his critics, and I know it's tough to deal with them. I just want these preachers to know that we supporters are in the majority. Please don't let minority critics dictate how you lead and serve. That's good to hear. Another is transparent. Every preacher that I've had has been open and transparent about the church and the direction we are headed. It sure has made our church healthier. And finally, they want a preacher that models evangelism. Our preacher is passionate about sharing the gospel, this person says. His heart and his attitude are contagious. What do you think? Would your list include some of these things, maybe all these things? I'm encouraged by this. I'm encouraged, first of all, because... Not anywhere on this list do you find they want a preacher who wears skinny jeans, who uh, is not offensive, that only wants me to be happy and preach good, fluffy lessons, and doesn't preach more than 10 minutes. I mean, I don't find any of that on here. So this does kind of encourage me. You may remember a few weeks ago, maybe even a few months ago now, I, I posted on Facebook a question. This question, what do you want from your preacher? What do you want in a preacher? And I got a lot of different responses. Here are some of the top responses. Somebody put, I want $5 million and some chocolate. Um, I want for him to root for a baseball team from Texas. That was my friend Trey Morgan who preaches in Childress. Uh, somebody put Hellfire and Brimstone. Somebody put, they want Venti Caramel Latte with three shots of espresso. I don't know what that means. Those were some of my friends who... Maybe some of them were preachers having a little fun. But among the more serious answers, the overwhelming majority of you and friends of mine who don't even live in Abilene said they want a preacher who preaches the truth. That was their number one thing. They wanted also faithfulness, 
guidance, and practical application. So here's what I'm going to do this morning. We're going to look at things from your eyes, and as I said, I'm going to speak on your behalf. You can see if you agree with me or not. Next week, I'm going to speak on my behalf to tell you what I think the preacher needs from the members. What do you need from the preacher? Well, I think first and foremost, what you need is for me to be biblical. I think that I am right in saying that you do not want a stand-up comedian. I don't think that you want a philosopher. I don't think you want a professor. I don't think you care about me being a Greek or Hebrew scholar. I think you want a preacher. I think you want a preacher who is biblical. I think you want a preacher who tells it like it is, even if what I'm saying is not always encouraging or good news. I think you want someone who's going to tell you the truth even if the truth hurts. I think you want someone who's going to challenge you even if challenging you causes discomfort. I think you want someone who encourages you as well. Someone who will encourage you and give you hope. And as I've told you before, that is my responsibility and my goal every Sunday. Every time I step into the pulpit, my goal is to give you hope. Because there is a lot of negativity in the world. There is a lot of negativity going on in your life. There are a lot of bad things happening around you and maybe within you. But no matter how broken or messed up you are, as long as you are drawing a breath, as long as your mind can think clearly, as long as your heart is pumping, there is hope. And I see it as my job and my responsibility to expose you to that hope each and every week. That when you leave here, you leave here, maybe messed up and broken, but you also leave here knowing that there is hope for something better. I want to help you grab onto that hope. Paul told the young preacher, Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Preach what? The word. Preach it when, when they want to hear it, and when they don't want to hear it. And do it with great patience, something I'm not real good at. I think you want a preacher who will stand where God stands, who will read from the same script that God is writing with no apologies. I think you want a preacher who will talk straight with you and not sugarcoat things. I think that you want a preacher who is willing to confront the issues without worrying about being politically correct. I could be wrong, but I think that's what you want. And I think you want a preacher that when he speaks, he speaks the utterances of God, as 1 Peter 4 and 11 states, not his own word, but God's word. I think that's what you want. I hope it's what you want because that's who I am and it's who I want to be. And I think you expect me to be a good steward of God's word, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4 and 1. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. You know what a steward is. We've talked about that on previous occasions. It's someone who manages and dispenses the goods of the household at the request of the owner, and that's what preachers do, right? We are stewards of the gospel. We make sure that we are faithfully and, and, and devoted to, to teaching what God has dispensed. We are dispensing God's word to God's people. Preaching isn't me telling you what I know. It's not telling you what you want to hear telling you what God says, and it's up to you to adapt and adjust your life to that. But, and this is a big but here, I think you want a preacher who does all of this with love and compassion. I think you want a preacher who does this in a way that seeks to encourage and motivate rather than to bring dis depression and despair. You know, I think part of my responsibility is to reprove and rebuke. And I know that some preachers get great pleasure from doing that. I don't. I don't enjoy that. I don't enjoy the lessons that involve reproving and rebuking. However, I love you too much not to. I want us all to be in heaven together someday. I love you too much to allow you to go to hell. I can't do that. 
I've got to be willing to preach the hard stuff. I've got to be willing to approach and confront the tough issues. You think about how many times that Paul had to get up into people's kitchen, so to speak. And even though that he had to reprove and rebuke them, he constantly addressed them like this. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for for you all, even to the Corinthians, in which he had much to say in the way of rebuke, he addresses them with the words, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 4, this time beginning in verse 14, he writes, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. You skip on down to verse 21, and he continues, Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? The Corinthian church was messed up. It had about every problem you could think of. Yet Paul wanted what was best for them. He wasn't trying to nail them to the wall. He was wanting for them to straighten up. Any harsh rebuke that he had for them was for their own good because he loved them. And of course, it was Paul who told us that we are to preach the truth in love. I think you want a preacher that preaches the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But I think you want a preacher who does that with love and compassion. Here's something else I think you want from the preacher. I think you want for him to be there. And this is a tough one for me. And it's only getting tougher. Because there's not enough of me to go around as we grow. As we gain more and more people here. I think a good preacher is not one who spends all of his time in the office study. I think a good preacher is one who goes to where people are. Something that I tried to do but something that is getting harder and harder to do. You know, Sunday is going to come around whether I want it to or not. And I've come to realize that no matter how much people work I do during the week, folks expect you to hit a home run on Sunday. And it doesn't go over very well if I were to stand up and say, well, folks, I don't have much prepared this morning. I was out with the people all week. That doesn't go over very well. And so there's got to be this balance, and I've got to be honest with you, it's harder and harder to find that balance. It's becoming harder and harder to be with people and still fulfill the responsibilities of being a preacher on Sunday. And I recall the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You remember when he was defending his apostleship? He thought it was absurd to have to do that, but he went through all the things that he had endured for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the church. And then he closes it all out by saying, on top of all that, on top of being beaten, on top of being flogged, on top of being imprisoned, and all of those things, I have the daily concern for the churches. I have a daily concern for those churches. And you know why I think he was concerned about them daily? Because he couldn't be there. In fact, he laments that, doesn't he, over and over again? I wish that I could be with you, he says. These were his people. He wanted a connection with them, but he couldn't be with all of them all the time. There just wasn't enough of him to go around. You know, folks, there are weeks where I feel like I have done nothing more than prepare a research paper to deliver to an audience on Sunday. I don't like feeling that way. But here's where I'm grateful. Is you guys get it. I'm thankful that you don't put expectations upon me that are unrealistic. I want to thank you for being so understanding about that. But I also want you to know I feel guilty about it a lot. One of the greatest guilts that I feel is the fact that I can't be with people more. Because I believe that people are more important than sermons. And I can say that, and yet I fall short of that week in and week out. Thank you for being so understanding. Thank you for not making it an issue. But I want you to know that I want to be there. I think that's what you want for me. That's what I want for myself, and I'll continue to work toward that. Here's something else I think you want from the preacher. I think you want me to be me. You know, as a preacher... You're always looking for just the right way to craft the right words in a way that makes the best impact. I mean, my goal every week is for you to leave here and walk out of here and you go, wow, man, what a sermon. To talk about it at lunch, to to talk about it with your coworkers on Monday, to just go on and on about what a terrific lesson it was. 
And while that's my goal, I do understand that that rarely happens. I want that to happen, but unfortunately, it just doesn't always happen. When it does happen, it's great, but it doesn't always. And so I have to be realistic in my approach to preaching and understand that, you know, maybe it's not always about hitting a home run. Maybe it's just simply about preaching what God has put out there. And helping people make a life application because that's really what it's all about, right? Not me just giving you information, but helping to evoke transformation, as we've talked about over and over again. But here's something that I've noticed, either in my travels as a preacher or even here at Oldham Lane. What I've noticed is when I share my heart, when I am authentic and genuine, is when I get the most response. That tells me something. When I am vulnerable is when I get the most response. That tells me that you want somebody who is genuine, who is authentic, someone who is like you. You don't need someone who is superhuman. I think sometimes people exalt preachers to superhuman status, that they're above the fray, they're above sin and all those things. By now, in nine and a half years, you know that I'm not that. That I am just like you. My marriage is not perfect. My children are not perfect. I do not always act perfect. And I think that's okay with you. Because I think that's what you want, really. At the end of the day, is you want someone who shares a pew with you, who understands your brokenness, who understands what you've gone through. People ask me, where do you come up with the ideas for your sermons? It's stuff I've dealt with. And I figure if I've dealt with it, probably somebody else has as well. So if you want to know where I'm at in life, just pay attention to the sermons. Most of the time, that'll tell you. It's kind of like songwriters. You know, here lately on on Sirius XM, I've gotten the Billy Joel channel. I love Billy Joel. And listening to Billy Joel describe the songs that he has written, 43 top 40 hits, and he wrote all of them himself. And as he talks about these hits... He's talking about where he was at in life and why he wrote the songs that he did. He said, I set out to to be a songwriter for other people. And then the more I got to thinking about it, he said, I don't want people singing my story. These are my stories. And so he said, you can tell where I've been at in life by the song that I wrote at that time. And it's kind of the same way with me in these sermons. Many times they reflect something I'm dealing with or something that I'm going through. And I figure you've dealt with things that I've dealt with. And I figure that's, that's what you want. You want someone who's relatable. Someone who's genuine and authentic. I think you want me to be me. I hope you feel like that you have a friend in the pulpit. I hope you feel like you have someone that you can make a genuine connection with because he's dealing with the same things you're dealing with. And not only is he dealing with them, he's honest enough to tell you that he is. I think when all is said and done, we can boil it down to this. I think you want a preacher. I think you want me to be Jesus. That's a pretty high calling, isn't it? Let me explain. I don't think you want me to be perfect. But I do think you want me to imitate Jesus as much as I can, both in and out of the pulpit. In John 8, 54 and 55, it reads, Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God, and you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I will be a liar like you, but I do know him, and I keep his word. Christ's number one priority was to glorify God. I know of preachers, and you do as well, who have spent their livelihood climbing the brotherhood ladder, trying to get to the top, doing everything they can to make a name for themselves, and they get to the top and they realize that that ladder was leaning up against the wrong building. I don't think that's what you want. And I may have been guilty of that at some point. But I've come to realize, maybe it's getting older or whatever it is, but I've come to realize my only responsibility is to glorify God and to be like Christ, both in and out of the pulpit. I've known of guys that were wonderful, remarkable preachers, but they weren't living it in their daily lives. You don't want that. You want a man that seeks to be everything that he preaches and proclaims. Not just who who says it in the pulpit, but tries to model it in his daily life. My only goal should be to glorify God in all that I say and all that I do. I don't want to be someone who comes in and punches a clock, who simply does what is required of him, nothing more, nothing less. I look at preaching as more than a vocation. I look at it as a lifestyle. 
And I think that's what you want. A preacher who lives it. You see, I, I don't really work for the church when you get right down to it. I don't work for the elders, really, when you get right down to it. You know who my boss is? You know who I answer to first and foremost? It's God. He's my boss. But I feel like that if I'm striving to live at the center of His will and do what He would have me to do, the elders aren't going to have any problem with the preacher. You're going to be more than satisfied with the preacher. If I can only glorify God in everything that I do and live as He would have me to live, I must be what I preach. You deserve that. You deserve a preacher who is, who is preaching what he is living in everyday life. Who is a manifestation of out in the world of what he is trying to proclaim on Sunday. You know, here's the deal. I have often thought for a long time that, that my role as a preacher was to be busy in ministry. I may not have described it that way to you, but in my mind I thought that I'm doing the utmost for God if I'm busy with God's work. Many of you know I get here very early in the morning, not to prove any points, but just because I can get a lot done if I get here by 5 or 6 in the morning and start working on some things. I can get done, and then if Zane has a tennis match or anything like that, I can cut out a little early, and I've gotten everything done. But I like to get here early in solitude when it's dark. It's dark outside. There's nobody around, and I can get a lot done, a lot of thinking, a lot of prepping. And I feel like, or I have felt like it sometimes, as long as I'm being busy for God, that's what really matters. I'm here early. I stay late sometimes. That's, that's what it's all about, right? Because I know of preacher friends that are that way. And I talk to my preacher friends. I say, well, you know, just out of curiosity, what day do you take off during the week? Oh, I don't get a day off. I'm always busy for the Lord. I've always got something to do. I think, oh, okay, well, maybe that's what I need to do. Maybe I shouldn't take a day off. I mean, they're, they're constantly writing books. They're out every night of the week doing a Bible study. That's not me, so I need to up my game. I need to be doing more, right? I don't think that anymore. I used to think that it was all about being busy for the Lord, and then I read Matthew 3.17. You know what that says? Matthew 3.17 is just after Jesus has been baptized. He's been on this earth for, you know, 30-something years. And just after he is baptized... God says to him, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And I read that one day and it all just like a light bulb went off. Because you think about that. Jesus had not done any preaching. He hadn't done any miracles. He hadn't healed anybody. He hadn't been busy with ministry. I mean, most of his life up to that point had been spent sweeping up sawdust, right? And yet God is pleased with him. Not just pleased with him, God is well pleased. That's what it's all about, I believe. And as a preacher, I think that's what you need, what you want is a preacher who busies himself with pleasing God more than anything. That he makes that his number one priority. And then everything else trickles down from that, right? If I can seek to please God each and every day, if I can be a faithful son who pleases his father, that's really what it's all about. So, if I can make that my goal, if I can live at the center of my Father's will, if I can do everything I can to please Him, I think you're going to be pleased with me. I think the elders are going to be pleased with the preacher. And I think ultimately, we will be everything that we should be. So what do you think? Did I hit the nail on the head? Is that really what you want from the preacher? To be biblical? To be there? To be himself? To be Jesus? We could go on with some other things. We could list a lot of other things. But I think at the core, that's what you want from me. And hopefully next week I can express in a very coherent way what I need from you. And hopefully we can strengthen this connection, this bond that we already have. We can all be on the same team. And like Paul said, that we can all have that unity that is so important. Now, I realize some of you sitting here this morning may be desperate, may be struggling with something that you need the prayers of this church family. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you have contemplated putting on Christ in baptism. That you, you know all about faith and you know that faith should lead you to repentance and to confessing Jesus as Lord. 
and then being immersed in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins, and you're ready to do that this morning, then certainly we want to take care of that. But maybe you're ready to study the Bible with someone. You're not there, but you're ready to study. We want to help you with that as well. We want this to be a family that seeks to add to this family. We want to be a family that is loving and warm and forgiving, just as God would have us to be. So if you need the prayers or support of this church family, if you need anything this morning, why don't you come now as Clinton leads us in a song.